it's probably a good thing for me to stop. Um, uh, go ahead and take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're going to get there in just a second. This is one of my most preached from chapters in the Bible. And I love the stories that are in this chapter. And we're going to have some fun tonight because um, what I love to do, and, and some of you know this, I love to come across a unique way of looking at something that we have come to know. And we're going to do that tonight. I'm going to present you with a, a little bit different approach to looking at this. It's fine. It's fine. Um, it wasn't supposed to fall anyway. Um, so Luke 15, we're going to be looking at the first 10 verses. Uh, we've been looking at different episodes in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, looking at the distinction between Christianity and religion. And as we've said already, religion is ultimately about us. It's about what we do. It's about our performance, our devotion, our commitment, our faithfulness. It's primarily about what we do. And we've also been talking about Christianity. And we've said that Christianity, on the other hand, is primarily about Jesus. It's about his performance. It's about his work on our behalf. It's about his obedience on the cross in our place. And we've pointed out that religion is primarily about our, and we used the word last week, transformation. Remember I asked you what transformation was about, and it's about life change. It's about us changing the way we do things, changing the way we think. Uh, we said that's what religion is mainly about, is that kind of change. But we also said that Christianity is primarily about his, Jesus' substitution. Jesus taking our place. So we've been comparing and contrasting these things as we see them compared and contrasted in the Gospels. So this week, uh, again, fantastic chapter. We're going to hit the first two stories here in the first ten verses this week. And then next week, even though we're not going to be here, we are going to drop a sermon uh, on Sunday out on uh, Facebook and YouTube so that uh, you'll get the rest of the chapter, which is the story we're most familiar with, which is the prodigal son. That'll be next week. So let's jump into this, Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. It'll be on the screens here as well. Please follow in your Bibles. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. Can I hear your best mutter? Give me, on the count of three, mutter. Okay, your best mutter. One, two, three. Okay, not bad. Not bad. There, there's, there's a little more life over here tonight than there is over here, so that more people. I think you're also farther away, so that may play into it. But I, I will tell you, this side singing tonight was fantastic. And it's only because I couldn't hear you guys, but this group over here, the whole group were singing, and it just, it, it sounded wonderful. Uh, so they muttered. Here's what they muttered. Verse 2, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then verses 3 and 4, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. How many does he lose? One. How many did he start with? How many has he got left? You got it. <laughs> Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Has that ever bothered you? Leaving the 99 in the open country? Okay, I'm just going to say that part has always bothered me just a little bit, okay? Verses 5 and 6. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who needs to repent than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And boy, we could just land right there because there's so much in that little statement. Verse 8 though. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. 
How many did she have to begin with? How many did she lose? How many she got left? You're paying attention. Good. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay. So we got this story. You've heard me preach about this before. You know these stories, right? Okay. My opening comments about this passage have nothing to do with the content of the passage. They have everything to do with the context of the passage. Can you explain the difference between the content and the context? What is the content? It's what the story is about. What is the context? The setting, where it's from. Okay, got it. Uh, there are two incredible things that pop out right here in the first two verses. And the first thing to notice, we have a question, is who was attracted to Jesus? Look in the first two verses there. Who was attracted to Jesus? Which of the two verses would we find that answer in? Pardon? Verse 1? Okay. And the answer would be? Tax collectors and sinners. sinners. Okay. It's okay. You can answer. You're not going to get it wrong. Okay? So these were the social outcasts. These were the moral outcasts. Uh, these were the spiritual outsiders. These were the people who had a bad religious resume. Okay? You got that idea. Um, these are the people that were attracted to Jesus. That's what the story tells us. Uh, and you've heard me say this before, but I think it's a good place to say it again. If we are not attracting the same kind of people that Jesus attracted, then we're simply not preaching the same message that Jesus preached. So keep that in mind. And, and uh, everybody say, wow. Wow, because wow, it's a good time for me to go get my drink over here. Yeah. And I'm going to, it's okay. No, 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 you're, you're fine. I'm just going to, I'm going to leave the tea there and I'm going to grab the water. Okay, thank you. And a big thanks to uh, those wonderful people who came and cleaned my driveway off today. You are very special people. Even Nissa. Even Nissa. She's a bit of an instigator. I don't know if you knew that or not, but uh, yeah. What can we say? Yeah. All right. Now, there are... Let's talk about church health for just a minute. There are many different ways to decide if a church is healthy, okay? Um, we can look at things like the financial stability of the church. We can look at the growth of the church. We can look at the attendance of the church. We can do kind of a deep dive on the teachings or the doctrine of the church, but I want to suggest that the real measure, the truest measure of church health is, number one, the presence of sinners. If there are no sinners present, then the church might not be doing what Jesus has called it to do. And secondly, would be the absence of self-righteous people. Think about that. Two things. The presence of sinners and the absence of self-righteous people. So, is the church, does the church have people in it that are sinners who know that they're sinners? Okay? And then, uh, is it filled with people who do not think that they are better than the person that they're sitting next to? So that, in a sense, I think that's kind of a, a measure of church health. Okay? So, who was it that was coming to see Jesus? The sinners, the tax collectors and the sinners. Okay, second thing to notice, here's the second question. Question number two, who was appalled by Jesus? And we only have two verses, and we already found that in the first verse. This is going to be in which verse? Verse two, it's going to be the opposite of what we found in verse one. The answer is, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. So these are the religious Insiders. These are the spiritual people. These are the people who have the incredibly moral resumes. These are people who appear to take God very seriously. They are law keepers. 
rule keepers, who always do the right thing, right? No, just in their own eyes. They always do the right thing, okay? You thought I was leading you astray there. So on the one hand, in this story, you have sinners who know that they're sinners that are attracted to Jesus. And on the other side, you have sinners who don't know that they're sinners who are appalled by Jesus. Okay? Now, I've said this before. When Jesus says that he did not come for the righteous, but that he came for sinners, he's not saying that there's only two kinds of people, that there are the good people, um, there are the, 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 I'll say this the right way, there are the good people who don't need Jesus, okay? That's the good people, okay? And then there are the bad people, and that's really the only people that Jesus came for, right? No, no. and... and and see, that's exactly what gets taught, though, in the church, is that there's only two groups of people, okay? And that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying there are bad people. This is what Jesus is saying. There are bad people who know that they're bad, and there are bad people who think that they're good. Are you with me? This is going to be very important to understand when I take you in, on into this story in a little bit, okay? The bad people who think they're good will never really listen to anything Jesus says because they don't think they need him. They don't think they need what he has to say. It's the bad people who know that they are bad. Those are the ones who will listen to Jesus. Okay? So, bad people came to Jesus knowing that they need grace and they need mercy. On the other hand, the religious are always grumbling about grace because in their minds, religion kind of sets up an us versus them mentality, okay? It's all of us good people versus all of the bad people in the world. And, and so they will say things like, well, we're better than they are, okay? We're more spiritual than them. We're more deserving than them. We're more important than them. We're more right than them. Which is why some people have concluded that religious types are allergic to grace. That's a thought. They're allergic to grace. Because you see, grace puts all of us, regardless of what we've done or what we failed to do, it puts all of us on the same level playing field of need. That's what grace does for us. So when you get the legalists and the religionists and the Pharisees and the teachers, they're always going to mutter. And what did they mutter in this story? He welcomes sinners and eats with them. And you know what? If it would ever come to the point where they would make a, a, a claim like that about us, I think uh, we would be in good company, don't you? If people would say, well, you know what? They, they're, they're not such good people. They spend all their time with low lowlifes and, and with uh, sinners. Um, and you see, it's the religious people just could not understand how could Jesus spend his time with those people? Because if he really is the son of God, then he really ought to be happy with the people that are really religious, okay? That's what they were thinking. That's why they thought Jesus was a fraud. Because Jesus didn't fit the mold that they thought was happening. Now, are you aware that we as a church are developing a little bit of a reputation. This church? This church. Yeah, we are. We ha have sort of been called the outcast church because we're filled with outcast people and we're being led by the outcast pastor. I kind of like that description, honestly. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, appeal to your bad boy side or anything like that. But I think there is something, this is, this is good, there is something sanctifyingly rebellious about what we're trying to do here. I think there's something sanctifyingly rebellious about who we are. And let's just say it this way, we are here for those who don't feel like they fit in anywhere else. I like the idea that people think we're attractive to sinners. I would like to think that, you know, like if we were in Jesus' day, we would be the place where the tax collectors would come. We would be for the people who feel unwelcome and abandoned in any other place. So, 
in reaction to the grumbling of the Pharisees, Jesus tells three stories. Uh, the story of the lost sheep, which we're going to get into in just a moment. The story of the lost coin. We'll also hit that one tonight. And then the story of the lost son or the prodigal son. And again, we'll look at the first two of those tonight. And then the other one we'll look at next week. All right. Let's talk about this, these, these stories. When I was growing up in the church, I was told that the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin were pictures of of evangelism. Does that word scare you? Is that a, a, we understand that word, evangelism? It means you're going to share your faith in Jesus with somebody else. Okay? And so they would say, look at these examples, and Jesus is trying to teach you, or he's trying to show you how much you should care about people who don't know Jesus. So I was told that these parables were Jesus' way to describe the lengths that we should go to to reach people who are not Christians. Hang on to that, okay? So that's why Jesus tells the story of the lost sheep. And he says, which one of you, after losing one sheep, will not go out, leaving the other 99, you'll go out to find the one, okay? Then he says, which of you, upon losing one coin will not stop everything to go look for that lost coin. And do you understand how this is a picture of evangelism in that sense? If there is one person out there who doesn't know Jesus, then you should be willing to leave everything behind and go out and find it, okay? That's okay except that it splits the world into two groups of people. Only lost people and found people. Are you with me? The lost are those who don't know Jesus, and the found are those who have accepted Jesus. Neat and tidy, right? That we can just divide the whole world into two groups. And yes, that is one way of dividing the human race, but that approach makes a very wrong-headed assumption. And that assumption is that Christians don't get lost. Stay with me. The idea here, and I've heard this preached, is, is that once you are found, you never wander off the road again. And my response to that is, after having spent most of my life inside the church, I am convinced that we need to rediscover the reality of Christian lostness. Okay? One thing that distinguishes Christianity from religion is that religion has no idea what to do with Christian people who fail or fall. Religion, again, remember, it's about me and my devotion and my improvement and my goodness and my sinning less. And because religion is based on those things, it can't make sense out of Christians who are weak or Christians who are bad. Really doesn't have a place for it. Now in religion, if you, believe, if you behave, then you belong, right? That's how you can tell who the, the, the good guys from the bad guys are. Christianity, on the other hand, is built on the expectation and the assumption that we are all failures and that we're all lost. Hang on to that, okay? C.S. Lewis once said it this way. I just like this. It's just kind of a blunt way of saying it. Jesus takes it for granted that we are bad. That's, right. That's true, isn't it? He takes it for granted. The good news about this bad news, okay, that we are absolutely desperate and needy and that the diagnosis of our hearts is not really what we want to hear, right? That we are bad or that we are needy or that we are desperate. See, the way God sees us and the way we see ourselves is often very different, which leaves us with a choice. Do we believe God's diagnosis of us that we are lost and needy? Or do we believe our own diagnosis of ourselves? Meaning that what? What did we talk about last week? 
I'm not a bad person. No, I'm a good person, right? I may not be as bad as some of those people, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. See, too many people believe that Christianity is good advice for good people. See, I think that's really what I heard a lot of preaching about when I was early in my ministry. Christianity is good advice for good people, when actuality, in actuality, Christianity is good advice for bad people. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad about yourself, but I'm trying to point out a truth that I think gets overwhelmed. But see, there always seems to be somebody pushing back on the idea that we are bad. I've had people tell me that I shouldn't talk like that. Because if we've been, if we've been saved, then we're saved, and there's nothing bad left in us, right? You've been saved? Anything bad left in you? I wasn't going to answer. I wasn't going to have you answer that out loud, but you did, didn't you? How deluded do we have to be to think that? If the whole world, I think I said this to you last week, if the whole world knew everything about you that God knows about you, if every little thing that God knows about you were put on the display in Times Square for the whole world to see, would you walk away from that experience still clinging on to the idea that you are basically a good person? If it was all paraded up there, I, don't, I think we would all be humbled in a word. I think we would probably run for the hills and hope that we would never see another person again. So I think it's true. Jesus, as C.S. Lewis said, Jesus takes for granted that we are bad. But there is good news in this bad news diagnosis. I just love talking like that, just to say it like that. Here's the good news. Since Jesus knows we are this way, there is no need for us to pretend to be something we are not. Okay? Once we understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, it blesses us with the freedom to tell the truth about ourselves. It blesses us with the freedom to get off of the performance treadmill and stop worrying about whether so-and-so is going to like us or not. When are we going to stop worrying about what so-and-so thinks? We spend our lives trying to conceal the worst parts of ourselves. And can I tell you something? It's exhausting. We're trying to cover it up. The gospel is the good news that everything we need in Christ, we already have. All of the love, we already have that. All of the approval, we already have it. All of the acceptance, we already have it. All of the validation, we already have it. All of the meaning, we already have it. All of the worth and the value, we already have those things. They are ours only because of what Jesus has already done on our behalf. The things that matter most, we can never lose. That might be worth writing down, Alita. Write that down in your Bible right there. The things that matter most, we can never lose. Why? Because of what Jesus has done for us. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God. Do you remember that story? They tried to hide from God in the garden. How did that work out? God found them, didn't he? Just like he finds us. And that's really what this parable is about. Without a category for Christian lostness, in other words, if we don't understand that there's something out there, like for when Christians get lost, all we are left with when a Christian wanders off into the far country and gets lost, the only thing we're left with is to doubt whether or not that person was actually saved in the first place. I'm so tired of playing that game. I really am. It's amazing how people weigh in about us after we've crashed and burned, wondering if we really are believers. I know <laughs> there were things said about me after I was let go to that effect. That they could not believe that a pastor would do things like that. 
And they could not believe that a pastor would fail like that. And they, um, I had calls for people, for me to apologize to everybody in the church, personally. Uh, there were calls for me to, um, uh, well, I had, I had at least one, if not two people, who believed that the sin was so grievous that I probably was not going to heaven anymore. And I'm, I think we're reading two different Bibles, you know, something like that. Um, yeah. Um, see, if Christians don't wander off and get lost, then when somebody does wander off and gets lost and falls or fails, is the only logical conclusion that they really weren't Christian anyway? Well, really, that's the only option that we're left with if we don't have a category called Christian lostness. Okay? And if we don't have that, that's kind of a religious assumption. That's not a Christian assumption. Again, remember, religion is based on the assumption that if we behave, then we're in. In other words, your good behavior proves that you belong. That's a religious way of thinking. The Christian way of thinking is just the opposite. The Christian way goes like this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John writes about this in John chapter 1. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. The God who made all people was rejected by the very people that he made. So did he just pack up his toys and go home and decide never to play in that sandbox again? No. God didn't come in the person of Jesus because we were begging him to come. Do you ever remember doing that? Begging him to come before? Um, uh, and he did not come because we were so good that he just wanted to be with us. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure this is good. God came in the person of Jesus because we needed him to come. We call this a divine intervention because we were addicted to sin and death. Now, we're going to make a little turn here. The fact is, we all get lost as Christians. And if you don't agree with me, we can argue about this later. But these two parables assure us that Jesus never stops finding us in all of our lostness as Christians. Rather than these parables being just about God's job description for us, you know, what they really reveal is God's tireless commitment to constantly come after those who once were found but now are lost could have, I think, entitled this sermon, I once, was, I once was found, but now I'm lost. That would go on a t-shirt, you know? I, I think there's a point to that. The point I'm trying to make is there's something about coming to the end of yourself that opens up your eyes to your need for God. There's something about seeing us the way God sees us in our need and desperation that makes us so much more receptive to his amazing grace that he so freely gives. There's something about coming to face to face with our smallness that reacquaints us with God's bigness and sets us free. So let me just put this bluntly, and you can go ahead and put that next line up on the screen. Uh, these parables aren't about found people pursuing lost people. These parables are about God finding found people who had gotten lost. See, you just turn the words around just a little bit here. You've got parables, and what's going on in these parables? God is pursuing who? Lost people who once had been found. I don't think I'll ever read these parables quite the same way. Okay? This is not our Christian job description. Okay? And I've, I've heard this all my life. Now, now, you, you go out there and you save as many bad people as you can. As if that's an application of this. Well, I hate to be the one to burst your bubble. You can't save anybody. You can't. You can be an ambassador 
for this good news. You can declare the gospel. You can communicate the radical nature of God's love and grace and mercy. But we can't save anybody. There is nobody in the kingdom of heaven today because of you, ultimately. And I'm not saying a bad thing about you at all. There are people that you know who are in the kingdom of God today because, because of God. God seeks and saves sinners. God raises dead people to life. God opens blind eyes and he softens hard hearts. So these are parables about found people who get lost. You want some proof for that? Sure. All right, stay with me here. In both cases, you got the lost sheep and the lost coin. In both cases, they were at one time not lost. Right? I mean, the lost sheep was in the pen with the other 99, right? And the coin, I don't know, was in a pocket. So these are things that were once found, but now they got lost. The lost sheep wandered off. The lost coin was misplaced. But the point is that neither of them started off lost. So to interpret these parables the way I was taught growing up, I would say is to misinterpret them. I, I don't think it's the end of the world. But these parables are about God and about his love and his grace. And these parables are not about you or me or what we should do. These parables are about God and what he has done, and what he won't stop doing. Now, to mention, well, let me just say that uh, the misrepresentation of these parables downplays, if it's only about really, what we would call really lost people, you know, people that were never Christians to begin with. If that's what this is about, it really downplays the reality of how quickly and easily we as Christians get lost along the way. Has there been a season in your life where you were just kind of off the tracks? Yeah. Let me give you a couple of examples uh, of the ways in which we get lost. Okay? First of all, we get lost in our pursuit of meaning. Or in pursuit of our uh, pursuit of, we get lost in our pursuit of love or purpose or importance. We get lost in our dependence on people. We get lost in our dependence on things. We get lost because we expect things to save us from our aloneness. We want things to save us or people to save us from our insecurity or from our inadequacy. People get lost all the time. We get lost when our hopes and dreams crash and burn. We get lost when our children go off the deep end. We get lost when our parents die. We get lost when a marriage fails. We get lost when we don't get the job that we thought we were going to get or the raise that we expected to get. We feel lost. We get lost when we have secrets. We get lost in our anger. We get lost in our hurt. You ever known people that were just so caught up in their own hurt that they couldn't see or feel anything else? We get lost in our bitterness. We get lost in our pride. We get lost in our self-pity. We get lost in our need to be right. We get lost all the time. We are perpetually and constantly wandering off. And we do it all the time. But I think, I'm going to take you one further here, that the deepest and most subtle way in which we get lost is when our roles become our identity. Stay with me. When our roles, I'm not talking about bread and butter, or Hawaiian, or hot cross, you know, whatever. I'm not talking about that. So let me explain what I mean when we talk about our roles be becoming our identity. Uh, many retired people that I've talked to over the years have described a sense of profound lostness once they've retired. Some of them have a difficult time knowing who they are now because their job that they had devoted themselves to their entire life, that was their meaning. That was everything. Their role had become their identity. This even happened to the late Dr. Billy Graham. In his late 80s, um, he told his family that he was emotionally prepared to die. 
And in your late 80s, that's not a bad statement, really. You know, I'm, I'm ready to go. Emotionally, I'm ready to go. But he said he was not prepared to get old, which was very interesting. And what he went on to explain was that he had always been an important person and a busy guy. And if you know anything about history and presidents and, and, and foreign leaders, uh, people sought out his advice. But as he got older, it felt like he was being more and more pushed on the sidelines. People no longer came to see him. No, nobody wanted his advice. Uh, and, and what he was acknowledging to his family is that this was a hard change. Because as much as, as he didn't want to admit it, unwittingly, his identity had become anchored to the role that he had. And it happens to us all the time. For so long, older people that I've talked to have located their identity in the job that they had and everything that came with it. And when they had to give up that job and assume a different role, they experienced a late-in-life identity crisis. I see this with parents when they become empty nesters. Uh, for so long, their identity was anchored in being a parent and taking care of those kids. But when the kids grow up and move away, the parents lose their sense of purpose and significance. They don't know who they are or what their purpose is anymore because their role had become their identity. When your role becomes your identity, you experience new forms of lostness every time your role changes. I thought I knew who I was, preaching at the same church for 22 years, and then it was taken from me. I got to tell you, in rather short order, I felt radically uncomfortable in my own skin. And I'm not ashamed to say it, I, I wasn't really proud of it, but I really wasn't sure who I was anymore. Why? It's because kind of unconsciously along the way, I, and I didn't plan it, but my role had become my identity. And now that my role was gone, I was experiencing something of an identity crisis. And you people just wouldn't leave me alone, you know? You just, you came, you came after me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But the kind of thing I'm talking about happens all the time. And there is this profound sense of lostness that we experience when that happens. But the good news in all of this, and we see it so clearly in this parable, is that Jesus spares no expense to find us in our lostness. He doesn't wait for us to come out of the woods. He goes into the woods and picks us up. Every time. Seventy times seven times. When we foolishly wander off, the Good Shepherd comes after us, picks us up, puts us on his shoulders, and carries us home every time. Now let me remind you, why was Jesus telling these stories? He's telling them because the religious leaders who were listening to him tell this could not understand why Jesus was welcoming sinners and eating with them. See, they had it wrong. They assumed, and dare I say there are many churches that make this assumption, they assume that God was for the clean and the competent. What Jesus is making clear here is that God is solely for the unclean and the incompetent, and the entire human race is made up of unclean and incompetent people. So God uses broken people who fail because there really aren't any other kinds of people. That's the point he's making. He meets our guilt with his grace. Isn't that wonderful? He comes into our mess with his mercy. He looks at our faults and freely gives us forgiveness every time. And, and please understand this. God did not ask your permission to love you. He just loves you. And it's his love for us that brings out our love for him. We love him, John writes, because he first loved us. He doesn't love us because we loved him first. We love him because he loved us first. His love is always the initiating love. It's a pursuing love. We are the recipients of his one-way love. 
And what I love about these parables is that the shepherd who goes out after the one lost, stupid sheep who wanders off. I mean, can we be this way? I mean, this is reality. This is the one stupid sheep who puts this guy's work in danger because he's going to have to leave the 99 out in the field to go out and find the other one. So question, what happens if he leaves the 99 and goes out after the one and then comes back and the 99 are gone? If that really happens, he's in trouble. Okay? What's funny about it is that nowhere in this story does the shepherd find the lost sheep and engage in a conversation like I would have had that would go something like this. There you are, you idiot. Why would you do something like that? You've put my entire business at risk. Stop being so dumb and stupid and stubborn. I'll give you everything you need. Just don't wander off again. Stop it. I think that would be highly effective, don't you? I, I, yeah, I, I think. But did you see that anywhere in the text here? Shepherd never says it. And nowhere does this parable even allude to that being God's emotional disposition towards us for what we've done when we get lost. Please understand this. This is so foreign. God doesn't chide us for getting lost. He seeks us. He finds us. He rejoices over us and then throws a party. Now there are two things we have to learn in this passage. And I don't have this on a screen. But uh, there are two things that we have to learn. And the first one is this. And you're going to need to write this down. But I've got to figure out the best way to say it. The first thing that we need to learn from the story is this. All of us are capable of failing in ways that we think are unthinkable right now. Every one of us can fail in a way that to us right now is unthinkable. Every one of us can do that. Okay? And don't sit there and go, well, I would never. Yes, you would. The second thing that we need to know is that God's love and God's forgiveness are big enough to cover the fact that our greatest failure may still be in front of us. God's love and God's forgiveness are big enough to cover the fact that our greatest failure may still be in front of us. Isn't that a sobering thought? I think back on some of my big failures in life to this point, and then to really understand that it could be worse. We are capable of failing in ways that are unthinkable to us now. And that's the bad news. The good news is that God's love and forgiveness are big enough to cover over the fact that our greatest failure may still be in front of us. Your greatest failure does not present God with his greatest opportunity to ditch you. Your greatest failure is not God's opportunity to go, boy, I'm glad to be done with them. He doesn't say, I won't leave you or forsake you if... He says, I won't leave you or forsake you, period. Period. God's love for us is ultimately dependent not on a single thing we do, but on what Jesus has already done for us. It's not dependent on what we fail to do or what we do. God's love for us is anchored in Christ's work for us, not our work for him. His obedience it's not based on our obedience. His faithfulness is not based on our faithfulness. Peter tells us that when we were faithless, God is always faithful. Why don't you write that one down? I think we got a slide for that one. God is always faithful. Do we? Have, yeah. Just write that down to remind yourself. No matter what happens to you, God is always faithful. That is good news. So, the picture that we have in this parable of the lost sheep has the shepherd leaving the 99 to go after the one and it, it's a beautiful picture isn't it if you're the one 
isn't it? The fact that he would come after you when there are 99 other people. I mean, I would say cut your losses, right? You know, so what? That's just one. It's not me, right? That, that's not good business if you're a shepherd, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, could you imagine standing there and addressing the 99? Saying, listen, I know you all have a tendency to get lost. But I want you to know, I'm going to take a couple days journey to go look for this little lost lamb. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> what is to prevent them? from going as soon as he leaves. I love the way Robert Capon addresses this. Look what he says. He says, this parable can hardly be interpreted as a helpful hint for running a successful sheep ranching business. <laughs> the result of pursuing one lost sheep will only be 99 more lost sheep. I like that. So don't use this as a model for your own sheep business, okay? That's not what it's about. What are you? Oh, you're gonna you're gonna take a picture, okay? Robert Capon. Uh, if you ever want to real read some really interesting things, this guy has written so much on the subject of grace. It's just incredible. But see, that's not what this is about. Now, listen to me because what I'm about to say is the only time I'm going to say this, but it's going to give you a thought. And if it can give you the right thought, I think it's going to be amazing to you. When the shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one, this is a picture of the divine spoils that Jesus left behind in heaven to come get us. You ever think about that before? Think about the 99 being heaven. Didn't Jesus leave all of that behind to do what? For people like us? Seriously? He came down to get us. In the book of Philippians, it tells this story. It says, God, in the person of Jesus, left all the heavenly glory behind. He became a man. He left all the divine spoils in heaven. Why? To come and get us. We were the ones who were lost. He is the good shepherd who comes to find us to seek and to save the lost. He left all of heaven. This is from Philippians chapter 2 if you want to read the, the verse version of this. He took on human form and frailty to come into the muck and mire of our lostness. Why? Just to bring us home. Over and over and over again. So this parable that we're reading is about the cosmic lengths that Jesus goes to to find you over and over and over again. He is the most faithful friend you will ever have. Have you figured out yet that people come and people go? People you think will be with you till the end of your life oftentimes bail at some point. But there is one who will never leave you. There is one who will never forsake you. And this one knows your badness and all the reasons why you don't deserve his love. He knows those reasons better than you and I do and he doesn't bat an eye. He doesn't blink. He never bails. Now wouldn't you think that our constant running away would annoy God? But it doesn't. In fact, it gives him an opportunity to do what he loves to do, which is to go and find us. So no matter where you go, no matter how far you run, no matter how stubborn your roaming may be, he will never stop coming for you. Amen? Amen. Why don't we stand and pray, and then we'll be dismissed. My hope tonight is that maybe you'll see yourself in a little different way than you have before. I certainly look at this story in a different way than I have before. And I think it is so important that we understand what Jesus has done for us. Why? Because you can't keep news like that to yourself. I had you pray for a friend earlier tonight. Somebody that you know. Maybe it's a family member. I don't know. But that person needs to know what you found out tonight. 
that Jesus is going to come after them. He's going to keep coming no matter what they do. They're going to be safe because they're in the arms of Jesus. Would you bow with me, please? Father in heaven, every one of us in this room is a sinner and we need a savior. And so we believe, Lord Jesus, that you are the son of God. And today, we want you to be the Lord of our lives. We believe that you died. We believe that you're the one who can forgive us. You're the one who rose again, so you're the one who can give us life. So Father, this is the, the life that we live. And I pray that we don't just keep it to ourselves, but that we give it to you and we share it. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. In two weeks, we will be here. Next week, there'll be a sermon on Facebook for you. And you've got the devotional notes here that you can use if you're having a party or something like that. And if there's anything we can do to help, please let us know.